Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, the podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? I'm your host, Tim Patrick, and this is episode 56, April 11th to April 17th, 1862. Last week, we had the Battle of Shiloh. So far, the costliest battle in the Civil War. This week, we will head to Georgia and Virginia. But before we do that, let's see about John Pope and the final collapse of the Confederate defensive line. So this week, it is worth mentioning that Island Number 10 falls, and the Confederate line needs to fall back to Fort Pillow, further south on the Mississippi River. If we can imagine now, things have 360 on the south in the Western Theater. Island Number 10 is gone, as are Forts Henry and Donelson. Nashville and Kentucky have been abandoned. Albert Sidney Johnson is dead, and now Beauregard will never have the trust shown to him by the Confederate president that he once had. In fact, Beauregard will soon be taking ill and relieved from command of the remnants of the Army of Mississippi. Now, could Johnson's plan for the defense of the Confederate territory have worked? Probably not, is the answer. It is well documented He was continually asking for reinforcements, hence why Van Dorn will be leaving Arkansas shortly after his defeat at Pea Ridge. Could Beauregard have saved the day at Shiloh? I think not. Regardless, we will have the next showdown in the West at Corinth, not too far off. Grant, meanwhile, will be without a command, blamed for almost losing the Battle of Shiloh, although generals like Sherman would come to his defense. John Pope will have his high watermark, eventually being called to Washington and given command of all the troops not under McClellan in the Eastern Theater. But we can talk more about that in the bottom half. Pope will become a favorite of the Lincoln administration, seeing as he was a radical Republican as opposed to the questionable McClellan. Reluctant to take command, Pope will show he perhaps was not the right guy for the job. Just want to backtrack a little bit and talk about the significance of the Battle of Shiloh. Last week we had a full episode, right? We did not get to talk too much about the impact that Shiloh has. Shiloh is important because it really was a great opportunity for the Confederate forces to even the odds with the Federals, most notably by maybe eliminating most of Grant's army before it combines with that of Don Carlos Buell. This particular region is not going to see as aggressive as an offensive action here that has realistically the opportunity to succeed. Confederate newspapers had actually reported that there was a great victory in the West because that's what Beauregard had sent them after the first day of fighting. So imagine their shock when it turns out that they did not, in fact, win the Battle of Shiloh. So there is definitely a hit to the morale there for the Southern people. On the flip side of that, it's a huge morale booster for the Federal Army, for the Federal forces. Grant does get put into the doghouse and he has a tough campaign for Corinth here, as we will highlight. But he is definitely getting noticed by Abraham Lincoln, and despite the efforts of, say, Henry Halleck, his star is still shining through. So Shiloh just adds on to his credibility as an eventual overall commander of the Union forces. On April 11, 1862, we have the capitulation of Fort Pulaski. Fort Pulaski is important because it was the first real example of how far armament had come and how obsolete brick forts were. 
Pulaski, in case you did not know, sits on Cockspur Island across from Tybee in Georgia. Cockspur forks the Savannah River, which flows, as you might have guessed, to Savannah, Georgia, which sits across from the border with South Carolina. Pulaski had been built as part of some of these older forts we have talked about in the 1830s, although construction was not 100% complete until 1847. As an engineer, Robert E. Lee had helped in the design of the water flow to the island. 25 million bricks went into the final product with walls that were 7.5 feet wide. At the time, it was seemingly impenetrable. It was a pentagon in shape and impressively enough contained a moat, which you can still see today. I think I might post some personal pictures as part of a travel review, maybe on the Patreon, maybe not, just to the website, but hopefully you'll be able to see those. Pulaski was actually named for the revolutionary hero Kashmir Pulaski, who is considered the father of the American cavalry. Pulaski was a Polish soldier who had joined in the war against England. He will die in the assault on Savannah in 1779 by the combined Patriot and French troops. Also present during this engagement was a unit of Haitian French soldiers, fun fact. As we have briefly discussed, Robert E. Lee returned for a time to be the commander of the district comprising South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. Remember, he had withdrawn troops after the federal capture of Port Royal by Samuel DuPont. Lee understood that the Union naval strategy was going to be to continue down the coast to capture the key southern ports. Savannah was the largest manufacturing city in Georgia. It was also an important port in terms of shipbuilding. Josiah Tatnell had been reassigned from the Janes to help in the Confederate naval efforts in the area for a time. Another Mosquito fleet was raised, Tatnell actually being the Confederate naval officer in command at Port Royal. He will be the next commander of the CSS Virginia after the wounding of Buchanan. Spending time in Georgia, Lee would realize that Tybee Island was not going to be defensible, being far too exposed. Union forces had occupied nearby Hilton Head, so it can be safely assumed they were having a very nice tour de force of popular East Coast beach destinations. A lovely vacation indeed. With the outer coast abandoned, Lee focused his attention on the bolstering of the defenses further downriver and closer to the city. These two works were Fort Jackson and Fort McAllister. Pulaski was considered by Lee to be a strong fort, but I think also sort of expendable. Troop strength at the fort was reduced to only 385 by the time of the siege most of the Confederates moving to other theaters or withdrawing back to Savannah. Confederate infantry would be potentially facing a ground assault of some 10,000 men. Commanding the position was Colonel Charles H. Olmsted. Despite the overwhelming odds, he had reason to be confident in where he stood. The Yankees could bash themselves against the works. Preparations were made, with trenches being dug into the parade ground and the deployment of sandbags as well as earth to protect certain areas. There would be a reoccurring cast of characters for the Federals. Samuel DuPont, who is fresh off the successful action at Port Royal, will be leading the Navy. Problematic William Sherman will be in charge of the Union ground forces. During the campaign on Fort Pulaski, he will be replaced, given his difficulty in working with the Navy. 
Sherman was also of the opinion that the fort was a very strong position and would not be able to be taken easily. Sherman's idea was to bypass the fort entirely and take on the works that had been started by Lee before he was reassigned to the capital. Now, officially, Lee was moved back to become a military advisor, but really, he was going to be, amongst other things, a go-between for Jefferson Davis and Joseph E. Johnson, but we will get into that later in the episode. The role that Lee was filling was also checking off a box for Jefferson Davis to satisfy the Confederate Congress as well, so it really didn't have all that much authority at all. Sherman would eventually be replaced by David Hunter, who we have already talked about before. The former chief of engineers shared Sherman's attitude, having been quoted as saying that if you were to bombard Pulaski, you might as well be bombarding the Rocky Mountains. This was not the opinion, though, of his chief engineer, James Gilmore. Gilmore believed that there could be a successful rendering of the fort from potential positions on Tybee Island using cannon and mortar fire. This idea would have been unthinkable in the years leading up to the Civil War, so it was pretty roundly dismissed. 700 yards was considered pushing the limit of a good range, while 1,000 was seen as probably not doing anything at all. On the other hand, the effective range of the rifled guns begged to differ. Getting the green light, Gilmore would set his plan into motion, but to do so would require much in terms of effort. DuPont had realized that the smaller streams around the savannah would be too shallow for vessels to safely pass. Confederates had sunk obstructions in the Savannah River, so navigating it without coming under fire from Fort Pulaski would be difficult. Thus, it was up to the infantry. Just getting the guns into his proposed range would be difficult. The area around the fort was very swampy, with northern troops sometimes having to wade through waist-deep water and mud. Artillery pieces were heavy, sometimes requiring 250 men to pull them into position. To make things easier, the soldiers would construct a makeshift roadway through the swamps. At certain points, they would come into range of the rebel gunners. So, despite there being hard work to do, it was also potentially hazardous. Finally, in April of 1862, everything would be into place. Ranges for each of these batteries would be considered well beyond what was going to be effective fire. The closest battery to the fort was at over 1,500 yards. The furthest was over 3,000 yards away. On April 10, 1862, the bombardment would commence. A practice that would be used throughout the war was employed by Gilmore. Each of his batteries had a specific target. Once completed, they would continue on to a new target. Return fire started from the Confederates, but it would slacken and then cease with the guns of the rebels being knocked out. Eventually, an entire wall had succumbed to the Federals, even with fire having slackened to around 8 shots per hour. So destroyed was the portion of the fort that there was legitimate fear of Union fire passing through the breach and hitting the powder magazine on the other side of the parade ground. Given this fact, Olmsted had little choice. Even if the Union guns did not finish his garrison off, the Union infantry certainly would, especially with a large hole in his defenses. Rather than allow that to happen, he would surrender the fort. 
Gilmore would move on to Cockspur Island to treat with Olmsted and inspect the damage that had been done. Over 5,000 rounds had been hurled at Pulaski with devastating effect. Now, the significance of the siege of Fort Pulaski we have already discussed. Answers could now be given toward exactly what kind of damage rifled cannon could do. Fort Pulaski's capture would ultimately close off the port of Savannah, although the city would not officially surrender until a different Sherman shows up in 1864. At no point would the Confederates attempt to retake the position. Pulaski would go on to be a prison facility in the last stages of the conflict, housing what will become known to the southern states as the Immortal 600, who would be subjected to rough treatment by their captors. Now, we need to head to Yorktown for the remainder of the episode. Actually, our story will be in Yorktown for the next month as McClellan displays his overcautious behavior. We really have not been on the peninsula for a little bit, unless you count the Battle of Hampton Roads. I think maybe we have not been on land in the area since maybe even Big Bethel. John Bankhead Magruder, who had commanded Stonewall Jackson during the Mexican-American War, is still here, manning the defensive line. He has maybe 13,000 men. Given the influx of troops by the way of the arrival of the Army of the Potomac, though, this means he is gravely outnumbered. Remember, McClellan had scrapped plans for any kind of overland invasion and switched it up to moving on the peninsula in an effort to capture Richmond. Union forces would stop along a defensive line dubbed the Warwick Line due to the Warwick River. There, both armies would wait for the next move. Now, it is important to mention the command state of both Union and Confederate forces. Let's start with the defenders. Joseph E. Johnson is still in command of the rebels in Virginia, so he is Magruder's superior. He is not one of Jefferson Davis's favorites and does not confer with the government as to his plans. This is part of the problem because Jefferson Davis is definitely a hands-on kind of guy. He takes the commander-in-chief role seriously. So having an officer like Joseph E. Johnson who does not talk to him about his plans is extremely irritating for Davis. A certain amount of secrecy is needed, sure, but Johnson is not very professional about it. Hence why Robert E. Lee shows up. Davis, hoping the two Virginians would be able to get along better. We had mentioned earlier in the episode, this is also a move to satisfy the Confederate Congress, who thinks that Jefferson Davis is wielding too much power without any kind of check as well. So there's this role that he creates that is sort of the go-between there. It is interesting, I think, to talk about how there is a potential class divide amongst these men. Davis, remember, is from Mississippi, and unlike Johnson, is not of this older class of aristocracy from the more aged state of Virginia. I've seen it pointed out that this could be part of the conflict. Johnson was also very unorganized, having a more laissez-faire attitude with his subordinates and he made sure to have his partisans under him in places of power, like Gustavus Smith, for instance. Johnson's plans in general were of the defensive, but it is often asserted that Richmond would potentially be given up if he remained in charge. Certainly, he had little plans in truly defending the Warwick line. Lee and Davis would argue that abandonment of the Warwick line would mean that Norfolk would have to be abandoned. Why was that an issue? Well, if you recall, they had the Gosport Navy Yard there, 
This is where the CSS Virginia had come from, and she currently sat there. More resources had gone into its defense as opposed to facing off against Burnside in the Outer Banks. Just walking away seemed to be an unacceptable option. In addition, Johnson would be mum on his retreat plans, so coordination of the evacuation of the area was difficult, or it will be when the time comes. Faced with an uncertainty in terms of his intentions, Robert E. Lee would work hard to make sure there were reinforcements coming to the capital. He would borrow from the Carolinas as well as Georgia to give more manpower, especially in the area around Fredericksburg, which was necessary to check McDowell. But let's mention the situation for McClellan. Obviously, we have talked about the dissatisfaction with his performance so far. He is no longer the overall commander of the Union forces, being stripped of that responsibility in order to focus on the action of the Army of the Potomac. Because of this, he will have no control over McDowell or any of the Union troops in the Shenandoah Valley. Throughout this campaign, Little Mac will be convinced that the rebels would have more men than they actually do. McClellan would be counting on the reinforcements in the form of Irving McDowell's corps. If he had those men in his army, he believed he would have enough to challenge the rebels, and perhaps even defeat them. This could be actually what McClellan thought, but it also could be simply something McClellan said, always worried about how he needed more men and how he was outnumbered. I've seen it argued that even if he had McDowell's corps under his command, he would have behaved exactly the same way. Unfortunately, we are never going to find out because McDowell's men are divided between guarding an approach to Washington and being deployed in the Shenandoah Valley against Jackson. So let's talk about the army makeup. It might surprise you to know that the core system was not an idea that George B. McCullen had, but rather it was an idea that came directly from the Lincoln administration. Corps commanders were to exercise greater control over their divisions, a measure of delegation, so that it did not overwhelm the army commander. McClellan did not get to choose all of his corps commanders, though. He had the older Sumner and Heinzelman, who we already talked about, as well as Erasmus Keyes, who will resign before the end of the war. This does not go over well for the younger army commander, but he does have capable and hopefully familiar names as division and brigade commanders, who will be necessary as the war progresses, such as the likes of Meade, Hooker, and Winfield Scott. In April of 1862, McClellan will have over 100,000 men, facing off against the meager, by comparison, force of Magruder. Magruder had been busying his men with the building of earthworks on the Warwick Line as well as around Williamsburg, Virginia. Advancing on April 4th by the Federals would result in some light skirmishing on Magruder's flank with little effect. Still, Johnson would scramble to provide reinforcements. In the meantime, Magruder reportedly moves his troops in a manner to make McClellan think he has more men than he actually does. I have seen certain places where this is disputed, though, as to the effectiveness. It is an interesting thought, though, and I do remember an Audie Murphy movie where they do relatively the same thing, make a lot of noise to fool the enemy into thinking there are many more men present. I think, actually, in the Audie Murphy movie, they rig a jeep to make it sound like a tank, uh, but obviously... I don't think John Bankhead Magruder would have had that capability. Uh, maybe he did. Maybe that's why McClellan stops at the Warwick line. I don't know. 
it is also very fitting for Magruder, who in many ways is the right guy for the job. The flamboyant general paraded his men in a kind of military theater production for the benefit of the northern foe. Remember, this is the guy whose nickname is Prince John, who obviously has a little bit of a penchant for dramatics and the finer things, shall we say, as well. So he is in the right place at the right time for the Confederacy. McClellan would not leave things up to chance, though. He would wait for his heavy siege guns to be put into position. This would actually buy precious time for the rebels. Needless to say, if he had attacked and had the Confederates off balance, he may have forced the issue and captured Richmond. This does not happen though, and the siege would begin, both sides staring at one another. On April 6th, a probing action almost calls Magruder's bluff, but McClellan orders a withdrawal. By the 7th, there will be at least double the amount of Confederates on the Warwick line. Eventually, the number swelled to around 72,000 Confederates, so not too far off from what McClellan had thought they had. Although, it is significantly less than like 100,000 or 120,000 that he's, he's constantly saying he's facing. On April 14th, there will be a council of war, which included Longstreet, Johnson, Smith, Lee, Davis, and Secretary of War Randolph. Johnson actually advised to potentially flip the script and move the army back north. This was sort of a surprising idea coming from Joseph E. Johnson, but the logic is sort of sound. He's saying that if all of the available troops for the Union, or at least most of the available troops that they have in the theater, are currently sitting on the peninsula, and you already had them sort of stopped in front of Magruder's line, and Magruder obviously doesn't have as many men, but they think he does, then why don't they take the rest of the army back north and maybe they could capture Washington DC even. So there is an interesting thought there. Longstreet actually is supportive of this plan. He thinks it's going to work, um, but at the end of the day, it's going to leave Richmond well too far exposed. So it's not going to be in the cards. Now we often think that trench warfare really didn't get going until later in the war but both sides would endure life in their works all the way until early May. Lee will start further earthworks around Richmond in the meantime. Something else I really want to point out is that McClellan does get some bad intel. He is told that there are good roads on the peninsula in this Tidewater region, and at the time, maybe they were good roads for just regular travel, but they were not conducive to an army traveling on them. So that makes moving the siege guns into position even harder. Now, some things that we have already talked about start occurring during the siege, including the use of observation balloons. Fitz John Porter almost flies into the rebel lines. George Armstrong Custer will also go up in a hot air balloon. In addition, the use of the Pinkerton Agency by McClellan will fuel the fires of his misconception for rebel troop strength. While good detectives, they were not well versed in military intelligence, so when captured men or civilians gave exaggerated numbers, they tended to believe them. During the prolonged trench warfare, we also have usage of Burdan's sharpshooters, armed with their sharps rifles. Let's pause there. This week, we can officially say Island Number 10 has fallen. In Georgia, the siege of Fort Pulaski will begin, leading to the rendering of the fort by Union forces. We have begun the siege of Yorktown, which will last all the way until May 4th. Next week, we will see the loss of the largest city of the South in 
New Orleans. If you like what you hear, please make sure to leave a review. Posted in the description should be a link to the website, Patreon, as well as Venmo information. Support for the general upkeep of the show is greatly appreciated. Once again, feedback is welcome. Questions, comments, concerns, the email is cwweeklypod at gmail.com. Thank you all so much for listening, and have a great week.